Hello everybody. Good evening. Mm. So we gonna warm up by sing some song. So this is a. Uh, so you know singing is a little bit more. <laughs> You see it? Yeah. yeah. I cannot hide it. <laughs> no um, singing also uh, practiced uh, meditation. So we have a lot of ways to practice, but uh, like walking, eating, sitting meditation, but singing also for us can relax and release the tension in our body and even in our mind. So we sing in a way that we feel that, that we, we truly come back to ourselves. And we see that we are we blooming as a flower, or we very fresh. You know that the flower is very fresh and so colorful, and sometimes we're not fresh so much. So we can learn from the flower, be, be a little bit fresh like flower. Uh, solid as a mountain, mm, firm as the earth. Okay, so we try. <laughs> Everybody can see it? Yeah. From far away, from at the back? Okay. From the middle, from that side, the bro my brother, my sibling knows very well the lyrics. Okay, who knows this song? Can sing louder. <laughs> okay, we have some movements. You can look at my brothers. Yes. <laughs> okay. Reading. I 
for ourselves flowers. <laughs> okay, we, we are going to move to the another song. Okay, my brother is uh, ready for the, the second. <laughs> Next song, hello. Next song is about simple joys. Simple joys that come from the earth. Simple joy in the present moment when we are available for them. And so that's a little bit of a maybe a bit more complex of a melody. So let's try one sentence each. Okay? Wonderful. <clears throat> I get my joy from the simple thing. It's coming from the earth. I get my joy from the simple things coming from the earth. I get my joy from the sun that shines and the water speaks to me. I get my joy from the sun that shines and the water I get my joy from the simple things coming from the earth. I get my joy from the sun that shines and the water speaks to me. Listen to the wind and listen to the water, hear what they say. Listen to the wind and listen to the water, hear what they say. Singing hey ya hey ya, hey ya hey ya, hey ya hey ya ho. Singing hey ya hey ya, hey ya hey ya, hey ya hey ya ho. All together. I get my joy from the simple things coming from the earth. I get my joy from the sun that shines and the water speaks to me. Listen to the wind and listen to the water, hear what they say. Singing hey. We can listen to each other, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Mike. I get my joy from the simple things coming from the earth. I get my joy from the sun that shines and the water speaks to me. Listen to the wind and listen to the water. Some movements. Uh, 
uh, maybe some of us may know. I'm actually uh, sure that my sister knows it. Okay, please sing louder. <laughs> we are the leaves of one tree. We are the leaves of one tree. The time has come for to live as one. We We are the ways of one sea. We are the ways of one sea. The time has come for to live as one. We are the ways of one sea. Star of the sky. We are the stars of one sky. We are all the stars of one sky. The time has come for to live as one. We are all the stars of one sky. We are all the Welcome everyone, and it's my pleasure to welcome these eight amazing human beings in front of us. And we have eight monastics who've come over from Plum Village, and today and yesterday is the beginning of their tour of the UK and Ireland, and I'm going to introduce them now. So we have Sister Tai Nguyen, Sister Presence from Vietnam, Brother Do Luong, Brother Generosity from Vietnam, Sister Tam Moi, Sister Samadhi from the UK, Brother Do Shen, Brother Mountain from France, Sister Mot Phuong, Sister One Way from Vietnam, Brother Tian Chi, Brother Resolve from Bulgaria, Sister Kang Tian, Sister Joyful Meditation from the US, and Brother Wang Fap, Brother Dharma Field from Portugal. Thank you so much for being with us. I would like to invite everyone now to enjoy a short session of guided sitting meditation. And so from where you are, please find a comfortable posture with your two feet on the floor. Your back may rest against the backrest or it may sit just oh, slightly away from the backrest. That way if you feel a little drowsy, it will keep you awake for this short session. 
And you may place your hand gently on your knees or on top of each other in your lap. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to be among each other, to enjoy each other's presence, as well as come back to our body, our breath, and check in with ourselves. We are going to cultivate mindfulness of our breath and mindfulness of our body so that we can calm our body and calm our minds. I'll read a phrase to guide your sitting experience, but please feel free to not think about them and just enjoy your breathing and let the words sink in and let the vibrations of the bell vibrate through you and let it shake off any dust that may be gathering in your body, in your heart. If you feel your mind is drifting off to a thought or a project or a worry, you can smile to that and simply come back to your breathing. This is our way to cultivate our mindfulness of our in-breath and out-breath so that we train ourselves to calm our body and calm our mind. I'll begin with three sounds of the bell. Please enjoy. Breathing in, I am aware of my in-breath. Breathing out, I am aware of my out-breath. In-breath, out-breath. Breathing in, I am aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I smile to my whole body. Aware of whole body, smiling.
breathing in, I release the tensions in my whole body. Breathing out, I feel relaxed. Releasing tension, relaxed. Breathing in, I feel connected to my body and mind. Breathing out, I feel happy. Feeling connected, happy. Breathing in, I feel connected to Mother Earth. Breathing out, I feel solid. Connected to Mother Earth, feeling solid. Breathing in, I dwell in the present moment. Breathing out, I enjoy the present moment. Present moment, enjoy.
your friends, you may slowly open your eyes, allow it to adjust to the light. You can give your face a gentle massage. Give your shoulders a gentle massage. Your upper arms. Your hands, rotate your wrists. And next, we would like to invite Sister Tamui, Sister Samadhi, to offer us a talk. community. Uh, welcome um, and thank you so much for inviting us here. We, we feel very honoured uh, to be here in this um, world famous establishment where uh, in fact you know all about what we're going to teach about today, um, about uh, our spiritual path and, and caring for the planet. I think this is uh, a foundation of your, uh, of your studies. So, uh, before we start, I'm going to ask my sister, Joyful Meditation, to give us three sounds of the bell, just so we can come back to our breathing. And I can come back to my breathing and calm my beating heart uh, before we listen to the talk. So sitting here and breathing, um, I was inviting my father to be here uh, with me. And uh, I'm going to tell you a story about my father. Um, when I was growing up, uh, and particularly as a teenager, uh, we used to have the most awful arguments. And uh, every time uh, we all sat down together uh, to dinner in the evening, the family would sit around the table and um, sure enough, uh, I would find something to start criticizing my father about. Because my father was really a product of his generation. He was born in uh, 25, 1925. And uh, he served in the, the British Army uh, uh, just after the Second World War. He uh, was sent to India. Um, just during the time of uh, partition. And he used to tell me many uh, wonderful stories about India, uh, which gave me a love for, for that country uh, from when I was a teenager. And, uh, but listening to my, my father's stories, um, of course this teenager uh, in me was so outraged. What are we doing in India? What were you doing there? How dare you go there? 
and uh, he was a card uh, carrying member of the Conservative Party. He really uh, liked Margaret Thatcher, I thought she was doing a good job. <laughs> so you can imagine the conversations. He used to call me a communist. You're a communist! We used to have these terrible arguments and my mother would just sit there be desperate, you know, her family falling apart. So much anger. And I remember uh, reading uh, Small is Beautiful, and that was fueling uh, more my anger as well, uh, realizing that everything that was happening in the world, we were going in the wrong way. And um, these were really terrible, terrible arguments, and they used up a lot of energy and really destroyed the relationship with my father. I was unable um, to see good things in my father. He was just this product uh, of his uh, generation. And uh, so this went on for, for many years. I'm just going to check my notes. <laughs> yeah, and that made me feel very stuck. Um, because on the one side, that anger, it fueled me to go out and join Friends of the Earth, which had just started, and to start demonstrating and uh, uh, doing all kinds of protests against packaging and for the seals and, and all these things. But that gave me more and more and more anger. And, uh, and I felt very stuck, which was quite uh, negative. And I realized that this anger in me was, uh, was unsustainable. It was actually destroying me. It was destroying the relationship with my family. And uh, it wasn't really helping uh, in any way. In fact, what I found was that uh, this anger was uh, almost like a um, traumatic response to the old system. Either I was going to fight, and I did. I went out on those protest marches and uh, shouted with, with all the others. Uh, or I could um, get into freeze mode and just become completely despairing and, um, and depressed and feel helpless. Or, look at my notes, <laughs> uh, I could get into flight mode and I'm afraid that's what I did after a while. I grew up a bit and uh, left home at 17, wanted to get away um, from this uh, household where there was so much uh, conflict. And uh, what do we do when, uh, when we avoid uh, difficulties? Uh, we get into distraction. And as we know, uh, the collective energy of our time is an absolute uh, master of uh, distraction. Uh, it is uh, very, very happy to be able to sell us everything we need to help us uh, get distracted uh, to what's going on uh, in the world. So, uh, I feel very embarrassed to tell you this. <laughs> uh, I was quite creative, so I went to art school and I became a fashion designer. <laughs> uh, there's no better way to distract yourself. <laughs> and so I went to Paris and uh, and threw myself uh, <laughs> into this uh, with a lot of joy of being creative. Uh, but the years go past, and um, this was before globalization. So it has to be said, um, the things that I was designing were being made in Germany and in Italy, where people were getting a, a correct wage. But maybe we might say, why was I putting all my energy into such a meaningless thing to do? And um, one of my first wake-up calls uh, was when uh, the first agent came to see us in our uh, design bureau in, in Paris, uh, showing all, us all these amazing things that we could do, that we could produce. And as a designer, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Because if I try and do something um, made in Italy, uh, like this with all this handwork, it's impossible. We, we can't possibly do that, way too expensive. And so I designed something, I thought, I'll give him a test. I'll, uh, I'll try and design something really extraordinary that looks like it comes from a museum. And so I did this design, and it got sent off. I didn't know where, the other side of the world. It took months and months, and I gave up on it. And then one day, a small package arrived uh, in a brown envelope, and I opened it up. Oh, my goodness, it looked like something from the Victorian Albert Museum. It was amazing, 
absolutely amazing. As a designer, you think, oh my God, this is amazing. And then, uh, so we said to them, well, um, how much, you know, is this going to be? So this is back in the time of uh, francs, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do some rapid calculation. <laughs> uh, I think it was something like 15 francs, which is probably about four euros. And this was for the agent who makes, you know, the money, because they then pay a small amount, the person who makes it. And as a designer, I knew that this had taken at least one week. It was all made by hand. And that was a wake-up call. Even now, my stomach has a big knot in it as I think about it. And I thought, this is not sustainable. I do not want to be here. Um, I do not want to be doing this. So this was the beginning of my journey uh, out, uh, my wake-up call. Can I have a sound of her? Oh, I just want to add another thing, is that um, uh, the, my chef of the uh, design bureau said, oh, this is wonderful, but if we add on our uh, two and a half times to make a profit, well, that's only going to be about 30 euros. No, we have to sell it for a thousand euros, otherwise it just won't be correct. It has to be a sort of price that fits in with the other things in the shop. I'm going to have a sound of the bell. So we fast forward a little bit and I'm starting to look for a way out of this industry for which I have trained for many years, thinking how can I make a living. And one day I picked up a book uh, by our teacher Tai called uh, The 16 Exercises for Mindful Breathing. And uh, I started reading this and uh, living in, uh, in Paris in a very stressful uh, industry and uh, living with a partner, bringing up children, I really felt like, um, uh, you know that uh, kind of circus act where they kind of twirl around plates on sticks uh, several at a time and one starts falling and then you rush to that side and you twirl it a bit and then you go and twirl another one. I used to have dreams about this. That's how I felt my life was. It was, uh, it was quite stressful. And when I read this book about uh, the 16 mindful um, the 16 exercises for mindful breathing, I suddenly felt like I'd stepped off the roundabout and I had discovered this place of stillness uh, inside. In fact, I discovered my inner meditator, uh, which is in, present uh, in each of us. And uh, so I, could, I started, uh, this was when my uh, spiritual path uh, started. And uh, I started meditating regularly. I went to uh, Plum Village and uh, discovered that uh, by uh, coming back to the breathing, as we did in that uh, beautiful meditation, uh, that we can find this place of uh, stillness and clarity and lucidity where maybe some of this inner turbulence is going to start settling and maybe we're going to get in touch with our deeper wisdom uh, inside. Um, so, I was going to write on the board what I discovered.
I'm drawing a bird uh, up there because uh, the first part of our practice, um, calming, uh, calming the mind, coming back to our breath, coming back to the, the present moment, is a very important part of meditation. But meditation, as our uh, teachers for, in our lineage have, have uh, taught us for many, many centuries, it, is, it has two wings, like the two wings of a bird. One is um, the calmness, the stillness, the stopping, actually teaching us how to stop. And the other part is equally important. It is the uh, deep looking. So I'm going to write that one up there. Deep looking or investigation. So as I started going regularly to, to Plum Village and uh, going on retreat and uh, joining a Sangha, joining a community, you will know how important uh, practicing in a community uh, is, uh, I started to investigate uh, what was going on to actually start this inner journey. It's not enough just to sit and calm ourselves to come to this blissful, pleasant uh, place to kind of chill out, uh, but what is um, equally important is to start deep looking, to start the healing process. And that's when uh, my journey of um, reconciliation with my father uh, arrived. Because I started to realize that um, my father is a good man. Uh, but he grew up, I started looking, where does he come from? What are other causes and conditions of him becoming this uh, uh, fan of Margaret Thatcher? Um, he grew up at a time after the, um, the First World War. Uh, there was a lot of fear. Uh, he grew up in a very poor family. There was a real, uh, very real uh, fear of poverty. And uh, lost his father um, in an accident, so his family had to go cap in hand to the relatives to find somewhere to live. And, uh, so that's why one of his greatest ambitions was to have his own home. Therefore, he loved Margaret Thatcher for uh, enabling, helping him to have his own, buy his own home, to look for that security and money. And there, there came an understanding, an understanding of his uh, need uh, to make money, this fear of scarcity, fear of poverty. Um, I remember seeing recently a, a poster, which probably the kind of poster which would have been hung in his schoolroom uh, during the um, yeah during the 30s, was this big map of the world, and of course a lot of the countries were pink, and there was Jesus uh, seen uh, standing there, holding hands with a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just horrific <laughs> to think of it now. But my father, you know, spent every day of his school years, you know, under that kind of image, um, uh, a product of, of such propaganda. So how can we blame? How could I blame my father? If I had been in his shoes, I would have been exactly the same. And so, as our teacher uh, says, uh, you cannot have love without understanding. And that was the beginning of the healing process when I could understand my father, to see where he was coming from, then that allowed so much love to come up. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I'm just not going to go there with my dad anymore. We're not going to have those uh, conversations. We're going to talk about other things, um, happier moments. And as he grew older, it was very, very important to start listening to him, to start um, asking questions about his life and. Uh, his experiences, so that he felt that his life had been of value and was of interest to somebody. Um, and we very happily spent uh, the last years of his life having a very beautiful uh, relationship because of this love and understanding uh, going together. So this is my, uh, my inner uh, meditator. Um, and this brought a lot of joy and ease, which I'm going to write on the board. I'm sure you can see that I'm getting into one of these um, 
Buddhist mists. <laughs> And then comes one which I had a lot of uh, difficulty with. Diligence. It sounds like hard work. But in fact, uh, oh, a better way, uh, well, a way that uh, speaks to me of diligence is um, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm being the energy coming from, uh, from God, uh, from the spiritual life, something which pulls us up um, and, uh, and gives us that enthusiasm. And so therefore, uh, I come on to the second uh, part. I've talked about my inner uh, meditator, and uh, we all have also an inner artist. And with this uh, inner artist, uh, we can use our creativity about how can we practice, how can we increase our understanding and love, um, how can we continue to practice when we get bored with it, when we just don't want to carry on, when we feel completely overwhelmed. How can we be creative, think of new ways uh, to keep inspiring ourselves, to keep ourselves on the path, uh, to make a sustainable path, rather than this path of anger, which is just not... Uh, sustainable and will only lead eventually to burnout. As we see in Plum Village, we have so many activists who come uh, to Plum Village who are burnt out. And, and we really feel that um, uh, something that gives us a lot of meaning in our, in our lives as monastics at Plum Village now is to be a refuge for activists to come and recharge your batteries and to learn ways to, um, uh, to develop this inner meditator, to create joy, which is going to be the fuel uh, for uh, taking action. It's creating energy uh, to keep us going and how to create this, um, uh, yeah, it, this water the seeds of our creativity and how to cultivate that joy as well. I mentioned the joy I can, that I touch from reconciliation with my father. Uh, but the cultivation of joy is a vast uh, subject and it's something that, we, uh, that can be learned um, joy and ease. How do we cultivate joy uh, on those days when we just don't want to get out of bed in the morning? Well, I have a little uh, checklist that uh, I like to, to look at if I feel my joy quota is going down. Uh, one of the first things is uh, community. Am I spending enough time with my community and uh, just feeling together, to borrowing some of their joy if I'm not feeling, uh, not feeling so good. And uh, how about my body? Am I taking care of my body? Am I resting? Uh, am I exercising? Uh, this morning I went for a run uh, by the side of the river uh, in Chagford and the joy of running uh, in the bluebells and the, the red campion and all these beautiful flowers from my childhood that I remember. It just uh, gives so much joy and we, and we know that if we wait until we're in the mood to, to go for a walk or go for a run, we might wait a long time. But if we just get out there, it would change our mood. And this is a, an important part of the practice to, to know how to um, change, uh, to change the CD, as we say, or to change the channel, um, to be able to cultivate joy. And uh, of course, a great call, a great um, uh, way to cultivate joy is gratitude. It's noticing. It's noticing, like this bouquet of flowers uh, is just so beautiful. And uh, if I didn't pay attention to that, these small elements of happiness in our life can just go right by. If we don't wake up, there was um, a great Zen master that when he was asked, why do you practice? His reply was, to be able to see the small flowers growing along the roadside. That's, uh, that's how to cultivate our, our joy. Maybe we can have a sound of the bell.
thinking maybe uh, you wanted to know how I got from um, being the fashion designer. <laughs> and in fact, that's where we also need a lot of creativity. How to um, design um, a way of a uh, right livelihood for ourselves. One that is, in, is aligned with our deepest core values. We need creativity for that. We need creativity. But we also need courage. And that's where I'm coming to uh, our inner warrior. Uh, we all need this inner warrior to develop our own courage to make those big steps in our life, uh, to let go of um, one way of living, uh, to let go of the old system, to see clearly that old system that my father's generation and also my generation as well are largely responsible with to create something new and to have the courage uh, to be a community of resistance when we know that the collective consciousness is going like this but we, we want to go like that to have that kind of uh, courage so I'm going to write uh, on the board having the courage uh, to let go. So I wanted to tell a story about our, our teacher, Tai, who is, as you know, um, an extraordinary uh, meditator, artist, and warrior. And he really encourages all of us to develop these three sides in balance um, in, in all of us. And he was once in a situation in um, Singapore where he was um, uh, with uh, Sister Chan Kong, this extraordinary nun who was by his side. And she, I don't think she was a nun at that time. She was a lay practitioner. Uh, they had rented uh, a ship to go out onto the seas uh, to pick up boat people, uh, to go around fishing for, for boat people to save uh, these people during the time of, um, after the Vietnam War. And um, there was a ship that was uh, full of refugees, but it needed to come in. But the Singapore authorities uh, would not allow it uh, to come in. And um, when they discovered what, the, what he was doing, they uh, ordered Tai to leave Singapore and they wanted to take away his passport and they said, you need to leave by tomorrow. But Tai had a ship with something like 800 refugees on, on the high seas with nowhere to go and he was responsible uh, for them. And uh, so what was he going to do? So what he did was uh, he had 24 hours uh, to act or not act. And he chose to not act he chose to do walking meditation all night, walking up and walking down, coming back to his steps, uh, freeing his mind, uh, just coming back to his body, uh, taking refuge in the earth, in his inner wisdom, and just coming back to walking meditation. And then in the morning, he had an insight uh, of how to solve this uh, difficulty, and he went to um, one of the embassies there who had a, he had a good relationship with, and those refugees were allowed to come to that embassy, and he was able to help them before he had to leave. And so as a warrior, we need to have the courage to know when to act and when to not act. Uh, something that can take away our freedom is our reactivity of feeling that we are um, responsible to do something, and we must do something. And Tai used to say, uh, what is it she used to say? Don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> Which sometimes can be the right thing to do. But do we have the courage to do that when everyone around us is panicking, is reacting? Uh, can we cultivate this still energy inside from our inner meditator to touch this deep place of wisdom uh, and insight uh, to know the right thing uh, to do or not to do. So, um, 
letting go, letting go of anger. Sometimes we can be very attached to our anger because for sure it's a fuel, uh, but it can be a very destructive fuel like fire. It can uh, be very purifying, it can be very beautiful, but it can be very dangerous as well. And can it be sustainable? Can we let go of our ideas of thinking, I know this is the right thing to do, those people are wrong, I am right. Can we let go? I'm sure you know about Thai's calligraphy. Am I sure? Am I sure? <coughs> Can we let go of that um, holding on to ideas of being sure uh, when we're not sure? Can we let go of the idea of our lifespan that we were born on a certain day and we will die on another day? That the earth was born on one day and will die on another day? Can we understand that we are part of the earth? The earth isn't out there and uh, we are here, but we are the earth. Can we give space to the idea that life is continuing? Can we let go of the idea that maybe the human species will one day be extinct, but our earth will continue? Our earth will continue as she's continued for millions of years. Can we let go of this attachment to continuing uh, this species uh, in its present form. And with letting go, uh, we can touch freedom. We can touch that space of freedom. When we let go of having any, um, of being so sure about ideas, of being open to life, of allowing life, of allowing nature, allowing the planet Earth to teach us uh, by the beauty allowing these flowers uh, to teach us uh, the impermanence of everything, including, including the earth, including the human species. But all at the same time, developing our presence, because um, when our mother gets sick, when our parents get aged, if we find out our mother is sick and dying, we're not going to abandon her, are we? We're going to take care, we're going to be with her all the time. And that's the same with our planet. Uh, if we see she's suffering, she's having difficulty, then we're going to care for her. But how to create this sustainable energy, um, this love, uh, this presence for each other, for all beings and the planet without burning out. And we do this with cultivating love and cultivating joy. So I think I've just about got to the end of my what I wanted to say uh, this evening. And, uh, and we're going to have a chance for some questions and answers. So maybe we'll just listen to uh, uh, a sound of the bell. Thank you for your listening. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, before we continue with the questions and answers, I would like to have a small moment to reconnect with our body. And what about if we stand up for, uh, for two, three minutes? <laughs> okay. Okay, maybe after so long sitting, maybe we can. Uh, can feel inspired to connect with our breathing a little bit. 
Let's feel, let's feel his body. Maybe we can breathe one time with our belly. What about if we stretch a little bit our head, like in the morning? Oh, our hands. <laughs> what about if we just stretch like that? Maybe we can make also this move. Stretch. One more time. It should be enjoyable. <laughs> and let's see how is my back feeling. My back can do like that. And the other side. brothers and sisters and dear friends. Um, thank you, my dear sister, for your inspiring talk. And I, I think that it may touch you deeply in different ways. And now uh, we have a special time to, uh, for question and answer. So this is um, the time that we can listen to your heart and really feel something, a question that maybe you have been holding for a long time. Uh, something that you're struggling with, any challenges, or something that is there. And sometimes you think that you cannot put it into words, but when your heart beats, that's the sign, there's something there it needs to say. Uh, and when we can put it into a question, somehow the answer is already there. So. When we, what we, we do is to share from our experience, our own experience, and it may shine more light on your question, and it helps you to see the answer from within. So we may have the, the time for two or three questions. Let's see. Yeah. And uh, so if you have a question, you hear your heart beating, you can just raise your hand and a microphone will be passed to you. And then we will listen to one side of the bell first and then we will, you will share. So maybe we will enjoy one side of the bell first just to get, connect, get connected to your heart. Mm. And then we will have the question. So now we will listen to one side of the bell first. Oh, yes.
to ask how you can love somebody that's not behaving very nicely. Thank you for your very good question. I'll just summarise it. Um, how can we love somebody who is not behaving um, very nicely, yeah, who is behaving badly, yeah, who is causing suffering? First thing, thank you for your question. Yeah, it's quite important. Normally, we love what is uh, easy to love. It's uh, more difficult to love those who cause us pain and harm. Yeah, yeah I remember uh, my relationship with my. The first thing that comes to my consciousness is the relationship with my brother. He was quite violent. He's uh, older than me and he used to uh, abuse physically, uh, beat me many times. And I, for many years, could not understand why he, he did that. And I had to become a monk to, to, to learn. <laughs> not, that's not the only reason. <laughs> But part of my practice uh, is teaching me how to understand them. Um, and that's uh, directly associated with love. So there's no love without understanding. That's what we learn in Plum Village. We need to learn how to stop, to stop thinking about stories uh, coming out of um, a victim position and taking um, action in, into looking deeply into uh, uh, why something came to be, looking at causes and conditions. So I could see that my brother was also bullied later. I could understand, I could ask him uh, directly, how was your childhood? Um, he was very young when he came from Angola. My family was born in Angola and they were displaced after the independence war. And uh, he felt uh, a little bit um, unsafe, and his conditions also were not uh, financially not very, very good. My family was quite poor for the uh, Portuguese standards at the time. And so he, he felt um, abandoned because my parents had to work a lot. And the violence that was um, offered to him was brought to him. He, he, he didn't know how to transform it. And so I was the, the person closer. Yeah. And sometimes the ones we love are the ones we, we hurt the most because they're close to us. Uh, so now I understand that. And I'm still healing that, that trauma, which is um, not stories anymore, but it's in the body. It's still, the body keeps the score, so it's still there. And I learned to, <coughs> to release it, true understanding. And now I love, I love my brother, although I, uh, there's many things still that I don't understand. And, but it's a, a practice, and it may take a lifetime or not. I hope this helps. <laughs> Thank you. So, dear friends, I also want to add a little bit to my brother's uh, sharing, um, just to make it clearer, because I feel that, um, yes, the topic of love is a very deep topic, and um, it's so easy to love someone who is lovable. Mm -hmm. Our teacher say it's just, we don't call it, it's a practice, like enjoyment. You enjoy the presence of that person. But to love someone is not easy to, to be loved. That's really, we need practice. And that's where we, 
we learn to, like our sister say, learn to look deeply. Mm. And, and for me, what has brought me to the spiritual life is to wreck the moment when I can recognize that um, to be a good person, I must be a very lucky person. Because I have very the favorable condition to be called good, to, be, to do what is so-called good things. Because if the environment, I was born in an environment where it's only violence every day, my seed of violence, hatred, I haven't, I didn't, if I don't have the chance to experience love, how can I know how to, how to love others? <coughs> so we are all conditioned, and that's what I realize. So I, I, when, I, when I do something good, when I can love someone, I'm humble, I feel, I'm lucky that I have the chance to do something good. Because I receive a lot of good habit we call the, in Buddhism, we call the good seed transmit, transmitted to me by my parents, by my, uh, this is the, the environment where I grew up, the, the, the school, the teachers, and the society. Somehow, more the good seed in my garden had the chance to grow more than others. So when, by that way of looking, rather than looking that person good or bad, I don't put them in the categories like that. I try to understand what condition have brought them to be like that. And from that understanding, that love is born naturally. So like the case of for my, my, um, my father, my relationship with my father is the same. When he was, uh, he was alcoholic, and he also caused suffering to my my family. And it's whenever I thought of him, all the wounds, all the pains just came up. And when I knew the practice, my teacher invited me to look deeply to see why my father became like that. And that is the practice to help me to really get in touch with his wounded child, how he was born, how he grew up. He didn't have the chance to get out of his suffering. And so he, he feel helpless, and alcohol is the only way. So when I get in touch with his suffering, just suddenly compassion and love just is born naturally. And I can accept him as who he is. And from that space of acceptance, of understanding, I can do something. I wrote him a letter. But from that place, I share with him the picture when he was not drunk. As a good father, how he's caring. And when he got drunk, it's just the two picture and share how I felt. And I said, Daddy, I share like this. It's not to judge you, but just to, for you to let, to let you know how I felt. And from that place of understanding, of acceptance, then it, does, it's helped my, it touched deeply my father, and it helped him to start his journey of, of, for change. It, it doesn't take quick, quickly, but it starts the journey. But it means that we can take action if something, do, if someone do harm, yes, we do think to stop, to create the boundary, to stop those actions of harm. But from the place of understanding, it's not from a blame of victim. That is what I, I want to add. Thank you.
first, and the Roshni is the third one. Yes, yes. Can I ask, how important is the concept of having faith? Friends, dear family, that's a that's an interesting question, and that's why I, I get a mic in a way. <laughs> because my parents uh, live not too far from Privilege. They visited not that long ago, and when they were asked by some brothers and sisters, "Okay, how do you feel about your your son uh, being a monk?" I say, "Well, oh, you know, it feels it looks good. It looks." Uh, Okay, it's great, but we, we have a bit of uh, trouble with the faith. <laughs> so I, I will try to answer my parents as well. <laughs> faith, I, I'm not sure what it means. What do you mean by faith? What do I mean by faith? And that, uh, for me, faith was not part of my vocabulary. Uh, when I discovered Plum Village, when I discovered uh, yeah, the spiritual practice, when I became a monk. Actually, I was brought up as very skeptical, rational, uh, secular, everything. And so faith is not really what I was looking for. I, I got uh, I got hooked in the practice uh, when I got in my head this image of Thai saying, "And now." And now, and now, can I be present now? Can I be with my breath? Can I be with my body? Can I be aware of what is going on inside, outside, now? And what about now? And now. And if it's not the case, I can do it now. It's not complicated. <laughs> like any child can do it. Now. Not Again, again, like not all the time, but what about now? <laughs> and I tried it, and I have faith that I can do it. I can come back to my breathing, I can come back to my body right now, and I see how it transforms the whole thing. <laughs> it seems simple. And it's so simple that I can carry it with me everywhere I go. Uh, and it transforms everything. <coughs> it gives me the space and the presence to enjoy all the beauties in life, like being around here. <laughs> That's quite a miracle. And I have faith that I can breathe, I can be present, and I can enjoy it. 
a little more now and again and the other aspect that I got hooked on when I first discovered uh, Plum Village, the practice, this practice that's not that different from others in many ways, is uh, being together and flowing together, the Sangha, the community of practitioners. I saw people with very different ideas, very different views, very different backgrounds and cultures try to organize a barbecue. <laughs> Usually, when you put like five people around uh, trying to light up a fire, <laughs> it's it's not that pretty. <laughs> or it can be a bit like all have different views and everything. And I saw that actually it's possible to have different views and to flow harmoniously with it and in the end to have something and in the beginning to have something and to be together with joy with understanding of each other and I have faith that this works <laughs> and actually that was in the past, and now I can touch something of faith, something that's a bit different, that, didn't, that I didn't need at the beginning, and now I look around, I look inside, I breathe, and I'm with my brothers and sisters, and I see there is something beautiful, precious, beyond words beyond understanding and grasping. I cannot explain it really. And it's always there. In this present moment, right now, together, in myself, in the world. It is always there. And that might be a bit closer to a traditional sense of faith. I don't know. <laughs> that might be my answer to my parents. <laughs> and they might not understand it, but I also try to feel that it's okay. <laughs> I'm very happy to be the son of my parents, even if they don't understand fully. <laughs> I, that would be my five cents. <laughs> about uh, the question of faith. Thank you, my dear brother, for the answer. For me, the answer is absolutely yes. I recognize the faith as a wholesome seed in me, and I pull my effort to cultivate faith. When I practice, my mindfulness makes me aware of, uh, of the beauty um, in everyone and it makes me aware of uh, places where I can um, contribute. And uh, wh when I relax in my... Uh, when I relax and connect, this gives me faith. It's something that I actively practice. <coughs> I put energy as well. I uh, practice mindfulness and concentration and insight. And actually, these five things, we call them the five powers. Um, yeah, what you said, there is beauty in everyone. And I think with my life, I can at least try to inspire someone to be, um, to unfold his beauty and his uh, spiritual um, presence. And I have faith. I have faith in all of you. I have faith after seeing this uh, place, after seeing the classrooms, mm -hmm. after seeing how everyone 
in the classroom. Uh, no matter how different you are, they have their place and everyone is searching for a different way to connect with the earth, to contribute, to understand, to go beyond the, the knowledge. And this gives me faith. Yeah, this gives me faith. But I'm, I'm, I'm developing eyes for the faith. If I don't have faith, I will go in despair. It's something that I cultivate together with you. So thank you, brother. And then now we have the chance for the last question. Roshi. Roshi. Dear Thai, dear beloved community, dear brothers and sisters. Oh, my heart is really beating. <laughs> it must be a good question. <laughs> um, recently, I had the opportunity with my class to participate in a grief workshop on climate change. And I realized that I find it so hard to process the grief and turn to a place of numbness where I don't want to look at it anymore or complete shutdown. But I know that the grief is so important to feel. So my question is, how do you hold that grief for the planet, for our species, for all other species, and to not become numb? and to hold it, transform it. Thank you. Thank you, Roshni, for such a deep question. I think it resonates with many people here and with us also. Yes, it's uh, the grief, such as the grief for the climate, the climate crisis is there, I think, in each of us. Mm. And we is it's important that we need to recognize it. Yes, there is grief. There is we need to recognize what is happening to our dear Mother Earth. <coughs> like we the grief also like when our like our dear teacher when he passed away. We all grieve, like as a community. So we, we create the space to hold the grief together. So it's important to keep the space for the grief. Recognize that, yes, there's the grief. And we can hold it together. But at the same time, we know that for Mother Earth, we know that Mother, like our sister share, Mother Earth is not out there. Mother Earth is in us. It's so important to remember that. So when we take care of ourselves, at the same time, we are taking care of Mother Earth. When I recognize that I'm losing my my teacher, I have the idea that I have lost my dear teacher. But at the same time, when I embrace the grief, somehow I get in touch with my teacher in me deeply. In fact, 
He's not only there outside of me. He has been in me very deeply. It's so strange to see that when he's not out there, I don't search for my teacher outside of me. I can get in touch with my teacher inside of me fully. It's like the Mother Earth, we can get in touch with Mother Earth. It's not only out there. Then we get in touch with our, our mother. Mother Earth is in every cell of our body. So the first thing, we need to take good care of ourselves. And despair, if we, we learn to take care of the despair by recognizing, embracing it by the energy of mindfulness. Whatever we need to take care, the grief, or an, an emotion, a pain, a wound. We need energy. Despair doesn't give us energy. So we need to generate. My goodness, we cannot buy in the market. We need to generate it by ourselves. By mindful breathing, coming back to our breathing. Mindful step, mindful eating. Be aware of whatever we do. Help us to generate the energy of mindfulness. And when the energy of mindfulness is there, it helps us to recognize, hello, my grief, I'm here for you. You are not alone anymore. I'm here for you. So like, we embrace it and we look deeply into it. And we know that we can do something. I see that, like in this, when I have the chance to visit the Sumaka College, it gives me hope. When I see young people come together, <coughs> learn how to, how to uh, build the world in a better way, how to learn about deep ecology, to get in touch not only the head, the heart, and the hands, to build the world. And it gives me hope. Hope is so important. Hope is like the seed that fragile and it need to to protect so each when we come together as a community it help us to cultivate to water the seed of hope and have it sprout create a favorable condition for the seed of hope to grow and we need hope because hope gives us energy that we can do something and the joy is so important. And the simple joy like we learned in the song of the beginning, the joy that doesn't need a lot of money to buy, the joy from the simple life, when we get in touch deeply with life, like I'm alive. And you know what? Being alive is a miracle. And just a few days ago, my close friend, he just shared with me that he wanted to bring his family to Plum Village. And from the beginning, I was so happy because now he looked for, he searched for a spiritual dimension to his life. But then he said that he's struggling with cancer. You know what? It's somehow we cannot stop running. We are forced to stop. And until when I'm sick, until that we that I treasure that life is miraculous. So that is really a big bell of mindfulness for me to remember that yes, I can breathe in and out. I can have good eyes to look my beloved ones. I'm still having friends on the path. That is a good fortune. I'm so blessed. And I, I feel grateful every moment for that. So let my, my sister share that the seed of gratitude have us bring joy from, this, from the place of complaining. What is wrong? It's sweet to the place of gratitude that was still not wrong in us, was still good in us.
in us. So I hope that uh, it helps a little bit. Thank you. So we come to the end of the sharing today. So thank you so much for your listening, your sharing, uh, your presence that, that give us the chance to be here with you today. I don't know if my sisters also have something to say. Yes, dear, dear friends, thank you so much for your presence. Uh, we just want to make a very short announcement uh, before, before we close is that um, if you would like to offer any dana, which is a, a traditional um, exchange uh, in the Buddhist community, um, then we have a, a little bowl uh, just as you go out. Um, and even if you have just uh, uh, one pound, that's, that, that's fine, or five pounds, that's fine. Um, and if you don't have any cash, then you can also um, donate with your, with your mobile phone uh, as well. Uh, because in Plum Village uh, we are currently um, doing quite a lot of construction so that we can receive more people. There is such a demand of people who need to come and take refuge uh, in these difficult times. We have activist retreats, a retreat for social justice, all these kinds of things. And there are so many people who need uh, to renew themselves uh, when they're starting to face burnout. So uh, we want to be able to receive more and more people. Uh, so we'll be very grateful for anything you feel uh, you're able to give. Thank you so much. So dear friends, uh, I invite you once more to come back to your body, to come together to the now. What about now? Yeah, you can uh, feel the, the contact of our feet on the ground, so you can uh, feel more grounded. You can close our eyes and just feel this sense of embodied presence can be relaxed, our face relaxed, our shoulders relaxed. And I will uh, read a contemplation, a meditation, so that we can connect before we leave this hall to, to our mother, the earth. And we'll start with uh, one sound of the bell. If you'd like, you can put your hand on your heart, so you can feel your heartbeat. It might be beating quite fast, or not. Dear Mother Earth, looking deeply at you, I see that we are one. I see the light and warmth of the sun that allows everything to be born and grow. I see the streams of fresh water that flow on this planet and bring life to the earth. I sense the presence of the atmosphere and all elements in space, the oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Without the atmosphere, the water, and the sun, the beautiful adornments of the earth could not be. The gracious oak, the singing spring, and the wondrous bluebells. I see everywhere the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. 
although how they interrelate with everything and it are uh, in me. I shall touch the earth and remain close to the earth to see that I am one with you. I am one with the sunlight, the rivers, the lakes, the ocean, and the clouds in the sky. The four elements in my body and the four elements in the body of the cosmos are not separate. I vow to return and take refuge in you, to see your solid and resilient nature within myself. Dear Mother Earth, here, in this moment, I promise to walk on your mindfully, gently kissing you with my feet and connecting deeply with you so that I can feel your energy in me and around me. We can open our eyes, and uh, after the, the next sound of the bell, we can stand up and just greet each other for, the, for this wonderful session and presence. I could uh, feel your full presence. Thank you for you.